Tonight, we're going to discuss uh, neurotransmitter lab testing. This has really become an invaluable tool for me in my practice. And so by the end of the evening, hopefully you will consider it as a tool that you can use um, to help get our patients uh, back to health. So let's look uh, quickly discuss some of the things we're gonna talk about today in terms of our objectives. We'll review some general treatment concepts for optimizing neurotransmitter levels. And you'll see I use the shorthand for neurotransmitter NT throughout this lecture. We'll discuss typical clinical presentations of individual neurotransmitter deficiencies and elevations. Understand the physiology of neurotransmitter secretion and metabolism in order to support these processes to balance neurotransmitter levels without the use of prescription meds. We'll talk about some of the genetic and lifestyle factors that can influence neurotransmitters. Uh, talk about incorporating neurotransmitter evaluation and treatment in your practice utilizing more basic profiles and more comprehensive profiles, and then talk about how testing uh, neurotransmitter precursors and metabolites along with neurotransmitters can help you with interpreting and fine tuning your treatment strategies. But let's start at the very beginning with a basic definition. Neurotransmitters are chemical messengers that regulate emotional processes and physical processes, things like movement, stress response, pain, and cognition. They function in the central nervous system, but also in the periphery to facilitate communication between the brain and the body's glands, organs, and muscles. Generally, neurotransmitters are considered chemical messengers between neurons, but they are located elsewhere in the body too. For instance, when serotonin is in the gut, we still refer to it as a neurotransmitter. Neurotransmitter testing can lead to successful treatment interventions for uh, mental health symptoms. So some of the things you see here might not be surprising to you, right? Things like attention deficits, cognitive impairments, anxiety, depression, addictions, et cetera, but also some more physical symptoms like chronic pain or headaches or IBS or issues with weight, fatigue and cravings. In my practice, I have found that almost everybody who comes in my door suffers from at least one, if not all of the following issues with mood, issues with fatigue, not feeling like they have enough energy, issues with insomnia, or with cognition, inattention type problems. So neurotransmitter testing has really become a crucial part of my workup. In 2015, the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development looked at antidepressant use in 25 countries, and they found something startling. In every single country they looked at, antidepressant use was on the rise. In Germany, Antidepressant use had risen 46% in just four years. And in Spain and Portugal, it had risen about 20% during the same period. In Iceland, about one in 10 people take a daily antidepressant. But that figure might underestimate the actual rate of use since that calculation wasn't restricted to just adults. Now, here in the US, about 11% of Americans over the age of 12 report taking antidepressants. So you may be asking yourself, why are these rates so high and why are they continuing to increase? It may be because antidepressants are now prescribed for things other than just depression. Antidepressants are first line medications for mental disorders like depression and anxiety, but now they're also prescribed for other um, both in and off label indications like insomnia and pain, fibromyalgia, eating disorders, smoking cessation, migraines, uh, ADHD, et cetera. And this study was done before the COVID pandemic. In the US, there was a 21% increase in all antidepressant and anti-anxiety medication use between February 16th and March 15th of 2020. So right after the pandemic was declared. So you might note that 78% of all anti-insomnia, antidepressant and anti-anxiety meds filled during the week ending March 15th, 2020 were new prescriptions for people who had not used psychoactive medicines previously. So you can see now during the pandemic and even post pandemic, the rates of uh, the use of these meds has really risen quite a bit. But despite these drugs being commonly prescribed, a study in 2008 found that paroxetine, fluoxetine and venlafaxine, these are SSRIs, they worked no better than placebo. A meta-analysis from 2011 reported that the relapse rate among depressed patients given antidepressants was up to 57%, while the relapse rate for those given placebo was only 25%. So maybe a sensible approach uh, to this common condition of depression is to see what the neuro and neurotransmitter imbalances look like before deciding on treatment. 
I find it's important to know what I'm treating. So where do I begin? As a naturopathic physician, we're trained to treat root causes. Most functional medicine docs try to do that. So I typically am thinking about hormonal, adrenal, and neurotransmitter imbalances. Neuroendocrine imbalances often underlie the symptoms that I typically see. So this is a sample report of a basic neurotransmitter profile. So you can see here what's tested is serotonin, dopamine, norepinephrine, epinephrine, GABA, glutamate, glycine, histamine, and PEA or phenethylamine. And then a more comprehensive profile would probably also include tyrosine, tyramine, dopac, 3-MT, normetinephrine, metinephrine, tryptamine, 5-HIAA, and taurine. So these additional values are largely metabolites so that you can see how the neurotransmitters are being metabolized. And it helps you make inferences about the activity of the enzymes that uh, do metabolize these, the MAO and COMT enzymes. What about the validity of neurotransmitter testing? I screen for neurotransmitter imbalance, like I said, with this urinary test. It's been commercially available in the United States for over two decades, but it's still a new tool to a lot of practitioners. And so we get a lot of questions about it. A common question I get, which I think you could say is actually a common criticism, is that this test is not valid because it's not solely reflective of brain levels of neurotransmitters. So I wanted to address the elephant in the room. It's true. Urinary testing is not able to solely test what is being secreted in the brain. But I would like to argue that looking at brain levels would limit my clinical approach. You know, I think the idea that the mind and body are separate is now really old thinking. We know that neurotransmitters are secreted all throughout the body and neurons of both the central, central and peripheral nervous systems. And neurotransmitter receptors are found in all tissues, not just nervous tissues. Let's take serotonin for an example. We know it influences mood, but up to 90% of our serotonin is actually secreted in the gastrointestinal tract. And epinephrine and some norepinephrine are secreted in the periphery as part of the stress response. Um, the dopamine receptors and all sorts of tissues, et cetera, et cetera. So we're not testing what's in the synapse. We're testing whole body levels of neurotransmitters. The only way that I know of to directly test brain levels would be to do a spinal tap to collect cerebrospinal fluid. And that was very painful and very invasive. I can't imagine we'd get a lot of people um, volunteering to do that. So, you know, this urinary neurotransmitter test is a peripheral test, just like all of the others we have available to us. This, the serum and saliva testing I do is also considered a peripheral test. You'll see as we look at some examples that the treatment that you do will change these markers. So uh, I find that it's a really excellent test uh, to give me information on how to get started and then also to monitor my patient's response to the treatment. And if you'd like to read more about the validity of testing, here's some uh, resources for you. We're going to move on to cofactors. So I want to show you guys here. These are little snippets from some of the biochemical pathways that we'll be talking about. And so the cofactors are always going to be in orange here to the left of the enzyme that they fuel. So in this case, I just wanted to give you an example of when we think about cofactors, these are the substances that are essential for an enzyme's activity. So clinically, I tend to think of them therapeutically when conversion is slow. So take this example. In this case, if norepinephrine were elevated and epinephrine were low, there may be an issue with the activity of this enzyme, the PNMT enzyme. Cofactors that support that enzyme are cortisol, and SAMe. So in addition to giving SAMe, HPA axis treatment might fit very nicely to support uh, normal epinephrine and norepinephrine levels. So here you can see all the biochemical pathways. And again, if you look at it through the lens of the cofactors, you're looking at the orange writing here on the left side of these pathways, and they'll be right across from the enzyme that they support. So a pearl when it comes to cofactors, using activated forms of the vitamins is really essential when you're providing cofactor support because if our patients are unable to convert the inactive to active form, um, they just won't respond. And so this is kind of a shortcut. So for instance, vitamin B6 will be given in the form of pyridoxal 5-phosphate, folate and B12 in their methylated forms, riboflavin would be riboflavin 5-phosphate. So you get the idea.
Now we know there are ways to actually determine the makeup of the microbiome with PCR testing, which can be very helpful. So there are PCR tests out there that include assessment of the diversity of the microbiome, as well as specific details on levels of pathogens and beneficial bacteria. Uh, the good ones will also culture out um, some of the bad things that they find. And so I find that this type of testing is really helpful in helping me treat my hard cases. Inflammation. So not every depressed person is inflamed, but inflammation is a common avenue to depression. You've always got to consider it when you're trying to determine the root cause. Inflammation works through multiple mechanisms. So we can see it can increase glutamate, decreases BDNF, brain-derived nootrophic factor, increases presynaptic reuptake of monoamines, decreases cofactors, and activates uh, various things that can break down um, amino acids like tryptophan. And this can all lead to depression, anxiety, and other psychiatric disorders. So inflammation is something that should always be considered. This article in Psychiatric Times from 2018 lists some helpful considerations when treating mental health, including assessing for a common cause, specifically inflammation. They recommend considering not using SSRIs as first-line therapy and recommend implementing lifestyle interventions like exercise, sleep hygiene, and meditation. And then they don't mention it, but of course, we got to remember our good diets. Um, a lot of these general concepts you can begin implementing while you're waiting for the patient to do the test and for you to get the results uh, and maybe help get them feeling better faster. So generally, after evaluating neurotransmitter levels, we can target the imbalances with the specific precursors and nutrients that are needed. And usually this involves amino acids, cofactors, and botanical therapies, specifically the nervine and adaptogenic herbs. The amino acid precursors can support low or suboptimal neurotransmitter levels. So generally, I recommend waiting until you see the neurotransmitter report before starting your patient on any of these. As a general rule, these should be taken on an empty stomach. And so I take that to be 30 minutes before eating or two hours after eating. And this just improves absorption. Most peptides and amino acids do freely cross the blood-brain barrier, whereas uh, whole neurotransmitters may not cross. So we give amino acid precursors to fuel the neurotransmitter pathways rather than actually giving the neurotransmitters themselves. So for instance, you might give tryptophan and 5-HTP to support serotonin. You might give tyrosine to support dopamine, et cetera. Now you'll see two things here, GABA and glycine, actually three, and PEA, they're starred because these are amino acids that actually also act as neurotransmitters and are available in supplemental form. The PEA and the glycine do seem to cross the blood-brain barrier. The exception is sometimes GABA. We'll get into this. Um, technically, the GABA molecule is too big to cross the blood-brain barrier, but there is some nuance there. Now, moving on to adaptogens, we are all familiar with these when it comes to HPA axis function, but they can also contribute to neurotransmitter balance. These herbs, and uh, there's some mushrooms here, they support the body in resisting and adapting to stress. So to officially be called an adaptogen, these substances must enhance physiology without adverse effects. Adaptogens promote optimal hormone and catecholamine levels, whether the patient started with high levels or low levels. They essentially promote balance to the entire adrenal gland. So that means to the cortex, where the cortisol is produced, and also the medulla, where some of the neurotransmitters are secreted, epinephrine, norepinephrine uh, in particular. And you can see some of my favorites listed here. These are not exhaustive lists. So moving on to nervines, these can be given in the morning or at night to restore and balance the nervous system. So I typically think of these for stress, anxiety, insomnia, and maybe mild depression. You can find combinations of these uh, in a tea, or in tinctures or glycerites or even capsules, but I find that the act of making a tea can also contribute to the anxiolytic benefits of these. And tinctures and glycerites often just have a faster response than a capsule. Okay, Makuna prurians is an Ayurvedic herb that's been used to treat Parkinson's in India. It actually contains L-dopa, also known as levodopa, which is a precursor to dopamine. So it can support low catecholamine levels. St. John's wort is an herb that I'm sure you're all familiar with. It's been shown in studies to provide equivalent relief of mild to moderate depression when compared to SSRIs. 
Um, St. John's wort can be considered as a short-term treatment option for mild depression, but do use it with caution because it's metabolized via some common cytochrome pathways. And so it can interact with a lot of common medications, um, things like oral contraceptives, that's probably the most common, but also things like warfarin and digoxin. All right, L-theanine, this is gonna be a very important part of your toolkit. It is such a helpful amino acid because um, it has these broad mechanisms of action. So L-theanine is found almost exclusively in the tea plant. And I like to think of it the same way I think about adaptogens, except in the nervous system. Um, it can be used to treat both high and low neurotransmitters because it has this sort of modulatory effect. It can act as a GABA agonist, which has neuroinhibitory and parasympathetic effects, and it can counterbalance the excitability of glutamate. Glutamate is the primary ex excitatory neurotransmitter in the body, but it can also modulate things like serotonin, GABA, and catecholamines. So you can see here the typical doses of L-theanine range from 100 to 500 milligrams twice a day. We give it twice a day because L-theanine has a shorter half-life than some of the others. I know a lot of you out there might like to use food as medicine. I do too. But when it comes to L-theanine, you might want to consider supplementation. A cup of green tea typically contains between 10 and 50 milligrams of L-theanine, depending on the grade of tea. So getting enough L-theanine through green tea alone is sometimes a challenging proposition. L-theanine can boost alpha waves in the brain which is an indication of relaxation. It modulates mood and creates uh, an improved sense of well-being, and it can improve cognition when it's combined with caffeine in its uh, tea form. Meditation is also an important therapy to consider. Regular meditation has been associated with higher serotonin and lower norepinephrine. Dopamine has been shown to increase during meditation. Meditation can increase GABA levels and also melatonin levels are higher in the evening after someone has meditated. Okay, let's move on to vitamin D. It's also a very important cofactor. It activates the gene expression of both uh, tryptophan hydroxylase and tyrosine hydroxylase enzymes. So these are the rate limiting steps in the creation of dopamine and serotonin. Just to make sure we're all on the same page when I say catecholamines. I mean, dopamine, epinephrine, and norepinephrine. Catecholamines comes from their molecular structure. Fish oil, not a cofactor, but I'm mentioning it because it benefits the nervous system. So the two major components of fish oil are the EPA, which has very anti-inflammatory effects, and DHA, which provides fluidity to cell membranes, and it's vital to brain and nervous system function. Inflammation often underlies chronic health issues, and it's been associated with depression specifically so fish oil can have antidepressant effects. And probiotics, also super important. There've been so many studies over the last decade that have demonstrated a bi-directional relationship between the gut microbiome and brain function. This is called the microbiotic gut-brain axis. So this emerging concept suggests that modulation of the gut microbiota may be a tractable strategy for developing no novel therapeutics for complex CNS disorders. Um, nutritional tools, for altering the gut microbiome will include changes in diet, the use of prebiotics, and of course, giving probiotics. And here's some resources if you'd like to dive further into that. It really is a fascinating field. We know now that probiotics can actually attenuate anxiety and depressive-like behaviors in experimental animal and human models. Evidence suggests that oral probiotics may have beneficial consequences on mood and psychological distress. The authors of this study proposed three potential mechanisms, competitive exclusion of deleterious gut pathogens, decreases in pro-inflammatory cytokines, and communication with the CNS via vagal sensory fibers. So all of these proposed mechanisms can affect neurotransmitter secretion.